Thanks for joining me once again as we continue with our series on creation as seen in Genesis. Today's passage of scripture comes from Genesis 2.15 and the title of our message is A Walk in the Garden. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. God bless the reading of his word, the word of God for the people of God. A walk with God. God walks amidst the whispering trees as grass engages with prideful flowers in a ballet, tempos set by fragrant breeze, tangled vines up trunks and Limbs do climb, the, the chatter of fledgling birds nested and nestled in the treetops, while creatures prowl and hunters growl from the shadows. The gentle wind makes leaves to quiver with silver shivers in the dawn. Clouds race across the sky in a crazy dance, a tango of circumstance. The sun pokes its fingers through the lingering canopy, caressing the newness of creation. I stand in the meadow, caretaker of all that is, keeper of the plan. I, I may not understand how I came to be or what God sees in me, but here I stand, a stick for a hoe and a leaf for a pan at the ready for his command. And God calls to me in the cacophony of new scents and new sounds, in struggle to form a symphony, God beckons to me and speaks. Let's walk. Let's talk. I have much to say. I struggle to match his gait, though he often finds he has to wait for me to catch up. My legs are not quite able to keep in stride. I find myself rushing somewhat undignified, believing it is possible to match my Creator's steps. How silly that must seem to be. How reflective of my humanity. I made this all for you, he says, as he stretches forth his arms and shadows fall across the world, clouds unfurl and tree limbs swirl. It is your purpose to tend and nurture, Protect this place for humanity's future. I place it into the hands I gave you so that your offspring may view this offering, creation as it was meant to be. Do not fail me, for the cost will be the souls of your children. And with that said, he took his leave. I closed my eyes and let the wind tickle my nose in the afterthrows of God's presence. I felt the sun upon my face and understood my place of grace in a universe that was made for me. There are multiple versions of the creation story found in cultures all over the world. Even the Bible has two side by side in Genesis. The first one we talked about last week, a story that reads more like poetry than anything else. It was a very dramatic telling of creation to people who were very limited in their understanding of the world around them. They lived the lives of simple nomads searching for their place within creation and their purpose before their God. The second story of creation in the Bible starts where the first one leaves off. This one is more of, an, of a narrative and it goes into more detail about the creation of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, the Tree of Knowledge, the Serpent, and the fall of humankind into sin. Now, while the first story moves along almost lyrically, the second story is where we find details about what went right and what went wrong. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that there are other references to creation throughout the Bible. Now, David talks about creation in Psalms. In Psalms 8, 3, and 4, he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? 
And Job spends several chapters talking about creation. And, and in Job 28, 4 through 7, God starts speaking to Job. And he says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. The voice of God speaks to us through Job and, and declares our hubris when discussing matters that are far beyond our understanding. He does this because, well, in truth, Job gets pretty haughty. Where were you when I laid the found, earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. If you're so smart... Don't just tell me how a plant lives. Tell me how to create one from scratch. Or, or how about a leopard or a penguin? How could you go about making dirt or sunshine? How do you construct a doodlebug or, or a snake? How about a mountain, a river, a lake, or an ocean? Do you even have a clue on how to create a giant redwood from scratch? In the New Testament, the Gospel of John starts out with the creation story. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We can see that Genesis doesn't have a corner on the market with regard to the story of creation. But, but this second story of creation that we're looking at in Genesis does contain material regarding our relationship with the Creator Himself and the purpose for our creation. We're presented with a vision where God takes mud and clay, shapes it, breathes into it, and makes a man he calls Adam. Now, from Hebrew... Adam translates as son of the red earth. Uh, the commonly held understanding of this is that God used red earth, which is where we get the reference to clay. And that is, it was probably also the color of Adam's skin as well. And from Adam, God creates a woman called Eve. Theologians across the world continue to argue over the literalness of this story in the Garden of Eden and whether it is intended as an allegory or the retelling of an actual event. Yeah, either way, it is still a narrative passed down by storytellers around a campfire, an oral history of events to explain the nature of something we cannot possibly understand in its infinite details. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you have heard the story of the elderly woman who pulls a box of photo albums down from the closet shelf. She just wants to look through the photographs and take a little walk down memory lane. And there are photos from her honeymoon and her husband standing statuesque in the sun. Pictures of her four children from their birth through their college graduation and into their marriages and the birth of, their, of her grandchildren. There are pictures of her husband and children on vacation or visiting the seashore and the mountains. So many pictures of Christmases come and gone with children unwrapping their presents and her husband sporting his new watch or tool for his shop. But the, then she realizes something. There are no pictures of her anywhere in the albums and, and she must think for a moment about that. And then she realized that she was always the one taking the pictures. She finds something very sad in that fact, almost like she missed out on a major event in her life. And in, in some respects, we're the same way when it comes to the Bible. So often, we don't know who the author is of, a, of the different books or events in the Bible, and, and it can start to become a little confusing. Now, <clears throat> Think about these things. God tells Noah to build a boat and put all the animals and his family aboard, saving them from the flood. No one doubts this, but who recorded that information? 
The angel visits, visits Elijah in the desert under the broom tree. Who was there to record it, and how did it become a part of the Bible? The Holy Spirit sends Jesus into the wilderness to engage with the three temptations. Who's taking that picture, recording that event? Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples are all asleep, and Jesus is in deep prayer with his Heavenly Father. Who's recording that moment? Who's the photographer? God creates Adam in the Garden of Eden and then uses a rib to create his helpmate, Eve. Now, who's around recording that event for posterity? Now, I'm, I'm not trying to make you question your faith or to confuse you in any way. I believe every one of these stories. I believe God has given us these stories, that he has inspired these stories, that he brings us these stories. And I also believe that they were handed down in a matter of oral tradition until they could be recorded in writing. Now, just because it is oral history does not mean that it is incorrect or embellished. God used people to act as human recorders of these events and to make sure that they were handed down to future generations. And when you read about moments like this in the Bible, don't get distracted because you can't see the photographer. The moment is just as pure as if someone was there to record the event. God ensures that when he engages that with his people, he shows us truth through his word, even if we can't see the spectators or the journalists. I'm neither a great theologian nor a great scientist. I, I don't even play one on TV. Still, I have never had difficulty intertwining the Bible with science. It has never been a matter of either or for me. I tend to, to view the Bible and science like a glass filled with water, representing the Bible, to which is added the element of oil, representing science. Even when placed in the same vessel, they remain somewhat separated, the Bible is a love letter from our Creator that announces and encourages our relationship with God. Science is the study of that creation. <clears throat> the Bible makes no attempt to explain the uniqueness of creation with theories, math, and scientific study. And science seeks to understand the nature of the universe only through numbers, equations, experimentation, and theory. That is why the two views often butt heads. Still, they can coexist if we don't try to force the oil to become one with the water. When one takes the Bible too literally, it will always conflict with the imperfect nature of science. Now, that may sound very strange to a lot of scientists. The same is true when one chooses not to include the mystery of creation and only focuses on the science. Science, while inclusive of creative thought, is based on materials that already exist, not the creation of those materials. Science can often explain pieces of the what in creation, but not the why. The Bible tells us why. The Bible tells us the purpose. The Bible gives us the purpose. The Bible shines light on the path. Science can only tell us that there is a path and maybe what materials were used to make the path. The Bible is the heart and the soul. Science has ever-changing facts, even though there are many people that disagree with that particular observation. Just as God does not change, the Bible does not change. Science, however, is always changing, no matter what anybody else says. A revolving door of new studies and theories, observations and conclusions. Um, I, I grew up in a world where 2 plus 2 equals 4. Today, 2 plus 2 can equal just about anything we imagine with our substituted variables, quadratic equations, trigonomic functions, and fuzzy math. It seems that science is always trying to disprove itself. Something has to be wrong in order for there to be something new to be right. 
The Bible is forever pointing to the rightness of the universe, knowing that in the end, it's all in God's hands. After all, it is God's creation. Now, while science can give us numerous examples of how humanity came to be, only the Bible tells us why humanity came to be. And when we look at today's scripture, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. We see in the verse that God not only created humankind, but he gave humankind purpose. And that purpose was to work the Garden of Eden and take care of it. Now, <clears throat> somewhere in the teachings of the church, we kind of lost this verse, this proclamation of purpose. We picked up the idea that Adam and Eve lived in a perfect existence in the Garden of Eden, wandering about willy-nilly, collecting fruit and giving names to animals and objects. But, but God knew that mankind would always be unfulfilled without purpose and intent. He gave us work to do, goals to meet, responsibility over the world around us. And although we were forced from the garden by our own actions, our sin, our disobedience, our purpose and goals and responsibilities did not go away. We are still responsible for this world and all that dwells within it. Now, Jesus tells us that we are still responsible to care for our neighbors, that our goal should be to leave this world in better shape than when we entered it. Our purpose is still to work and grow as God intended. It is built into our nature. We find fulfillment in pleasing our Creator. Now this week, I want us all to reflect on today's scripture. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Let our purpose shine forth in all that we do. And instead of just walking around this gift of creation, let's find our purpose and our responsibility for taking care of it. Let us speak words of encouragement to those around us. Let us work the garden as intended. Let us show others how God intended for our characters to exhibit an attitude of work, growth, and service. May that work, growth, and service lift others and point them to our Creator and the amazing gift of grace through His Son. God bless you all. Amen.